Let's start with a joke. Which cheese lives in a galaxy far, far away? Boba Fetter. <laughs> right. Okay. Recently, so we've just started the playlist for 2023 on Samurai History. And the Shogun has just put his video up which is somewhere here. And uh, it is basically... <coughs> an overview of the Ronin and is a superb video, is a wonderful video and I'm going to link it down below and we've got the playlist. So don't forget, look at the playlist, look at the show in its video. So let's have a look at what we've learned. But what I will do, will do is go into one of the sticky points at the end of the video, but let's have a look at what we've learned. Basically, the idea of Ronin is this, you know, we all think this cool guy who runs around with a great sword. He's great at swordsmanship. He's amazing. He's a great, uh, he's a specialist in martial arts. And he sort of sits there with a, a straw in his mouth and kills people. We get this really from sort of the films in Japanese cinema. And if you want to know a cool secret about Japanese cinema and the Ronin and uh, America, wait till the end. Right. So... And the Shogun, correctly so, blows this all away and he's like, nope, nope, that's not true. And basically what we have is a term which means either floating people or the people of the wave. Or I think there's another version which is sort of prison people, which is a little bit ambiguous, a little bit difficult. We're going to have to really look into that term because it implies they're criminals. But um, what we do have is this idea that they're outside of samurai society, but we know they are samurai. They will most likely have carried two swords, being, you know... Um, called samurai, understood as samurai, and they are just simply samurai, born as samurai, who, you know, have no employment, basically. But one of the major things that uh, the Shogunate points out, that Nick points out, and, and correctly so, is that there are so many various levels of this. You get, like, you get two main distinctions. Being a ronin in the Sengoku period and being a ronin in the Edo period are totally separate things, but we'll do that a bit more at the end. So what you have here is the idea that there are actually samurai who are very, ronin, sorry, who are very, very powerful people. And you get, um, like, for example, Yamagasoko, who does, uh, I think he's banished at some point for, um, for basically writing anti-propaganda against the Tokugawa shogunate. You get Yui Shosetsu um, because he is uh, tries a coup, probably with Tokugawa Yorinobu. These people are powerful, powerful people. And we do know um, from Yui Shosetsu that there's probably a dojo culture of people being pulled together of Ronin, who are studying various arts, studying ways, but are highly political. And we know this happens again in the Boshin War, when a lot of the samurai come together and they're very political within their factions and dojos. It's not just the case you go to your dojo and you learn your martial arts and that's it. They're friends, they become political, they run assassinations, and all sorts of stuff happens with both samurai and Ronin. So it's not a case of you've got the strict samurai there who go to their lord, and the Ronin on the outside who, you know, just can't eat but a brilliant swordsman and what we have to look at here is how people have di their own income and wealth and their own sway with political power will change the way you should look at it so someone who may have lots of money but no master might have a lot more political sway than someone who's a samurai who's got a master but has got no money. Do you know what I mean? There's different ways. Then, of course, you've got the political movements like Yui Shosetsu and Yamaga Soko, who sort of, uh, you know, can start pushing the political boundaries. They get ideal ideological power where people follow them for ideological reasons. So what you find here is that there's a much more brilliant stream of political mo of power moving around in the in the sort of the culture of the Ronin. Now, what you have to remember, though, is some of them do become, we do have a small selection who are these hard men with swords, chewing tobacco. Yeah, I'm a goddamn sexual Tyrannosaurus, just like me. Name the film. And it should be easy for everyone, that. So uh, we do get those types of people who are literally hired out as bodyguards, your Jimbo, and they're doing, probably becoming bandit samurai. And we know we have... No bushi, which means field like um, no dachi means field tachi, yeah, and by that it means practical in the in the sort of field in this term in Japanese means there's a practicality about it. it's ro robust, rustic. It's not 
pretty. It's not there. So no bushy is like samurai of the field, bandit samurai out there in the wilderness doing banditry stuff. Nodachi means a robust sword that is a great sword and can hack through horses, yeah? Instead of the ceremonial court swords. You know, there's lots of that elements coming to it. So what we do find is we've got people without jobs who might be sat there making umbrellas and selling little bird cages like we see in the films and for, for money. Or you might have people hiring themselves out of your Jimbo. You might have people who have a decent income, have connections with other families, have a good income or have um, their own dojo set up because they're not samurai. It doesn't mean they can't own a business and they, you know, the Ronin own business of big dojos, with lots of fees. And this is where you start to get the incline in dojo culture. So I call it dojo culture because this idea that before that most people learned in the in the in how can i say this before the one castle one domain um rule you tended to get samurai were separated a lot more and spread out which means you get less and less communities of various samurai coming together you tend to get smaller villages hamlets and they tend to be family orientated and married into each other. When you get the one castle, one one domain, one castle rule, a lot of the castles go to low flatland and they become town, they become focal points for town. You still see this in all of Japan. The focal point of each major ancient city is a castle. And what we find there is Ronin streaming in and trying to get jobs, Ronin streaming in and clicking on on the dojo culture thievery bandits yakuza start coming up and all that type of thing starts happening so this is the sort of things we're learning from uh nick's video and what i'm putting in as well you get this idea that each ronin is independent and what their background is like becomes independent for example here's an example for you miyamoto masashi yeah considered ronin yeah he is not he does serve a lord at some point, but actually he's a paid guest. So he's to get around the idea that you can't hire someone. So, for example, the uh, the Ronin issue in the Edo period is that a lot of the times there's a ban on hiring new samurai. So you can't increase the amount of samurai you have. So you can't become a threat to the shogunate and become powerful. Or they start to the shogunate starts out a lot of different ways from castle building, from moving your entire household up and down every couple of years, um, to stopping them growing their their martial strength. They do lots of things to keep the samurai families down. And as a result of this and many other factors, the merchant class starts to rise and the samurai starts to lower. And we find that there's the Ronins become bandits and problems and there's political rallies and there's all sorts of issues going on with like street fights, the lot. And eventually the Shogun has to fix this and say, come on, you know, this Ronin problem is getting too much. That's going back to what we're talking about, Sengoku period Ronin and Edo period Ronin. But we'll do a little bit more of that. So what we find here is that god i've lost my train of thought see go off there so what we find basically is that the role you get paid guests going back to masashi you find that they can't be hired we can't hire you but we can pay you to be a guest so sit here drink tea teach us all martial arts we we our province our domain is hiring the mighty miyamoto masashi for a small period of time but we're actually just giving you cash to sit here and have hot baths and chill out and we gain the reputation and the knowledge of you being here so that's one way to get around the ronin problem so this leads me into um the this leads me into one of the sticky points of it which is the idea of mercenaries and, and nick points this out he says it's a difficult one because samurai being mercenaries um, or Ronin being mercenaries becomes a problematic issue because we, we're crossing terms. First of all, people don't clearly understand or fully understand the term Ronin correctly and people have a vague idea of mercenary. So when you mix two terms from two languages, from two cultures, to try to get across an idea, you start to get some sticking points. So what I'm going to do is go through that now. Now, I'm going to start to, please bear with me, this is only short, I'm going to read from a 1654 manual. This is called Musha Monogatari. It's in the book Samurai War Stories by me. Uh, myself and Yoshie got this translated. So I'm going to be reading for you article... Um, uh, hold on right eight article eight on page 65 and i'm bear with me because i'm going to highlight here the idea of samurai who are uh, move between people mercenary type samurai and samurai who are long staying so let's go it's only a page 
but there's some difficult Japanese words, so I'll just jump over the Japanese terms, sorry, you know, the, uh, the names. According to an old samurai story, there was a brave samurai whose name was Ogasawara Kento, um, and his master was whatever, who was the lord of uh, a castle in Kaga Domain, okay? Kento was brisk and competent, but clumsy and unsociable. Um, so he did not get a very high splendid. So uh, Kento basically stayed in a low rank. He was not great. He'd stayed with his master because his dad was his master and his dad was with his master. And they were generational retainers, which I'll go on to in a minute in a different book. So there was a ronin, and I've translated this as mercenary samurai, whose name was um, Iguchi so Iguchi, the master of the castle, um, and he, the master of the castle employed him for quite a high amount of money. So his, re, his generational retainer is on a low amount of money, and his newcomer Ronin is on a high amount of money. Uh, he was well presented and conducted himself with honour. Upon hearing this, Kento, the low class normal one, the clumsy said to himself, well, there is no one in Japan who does not know of... Um, me from his clan, I am well known, but how is it anyone can think this newcomer's bravery could be good enough to serve this clan? Good grief, the wonder of it. He waited impatiently so he could meet this guy. So basically, you've got a low ranking person who's from a famous family, maybe well known, but not great. And you've got this newcomer who's a Ronin who's awesome, he's out there, he's in the wars, he's fighting people, he's doing whatever. Um, blah blah blah. Um, when the day come, um, the newly hired samurai attended the castle for the first time and Kento was there waiting for him. And he ap appeared in the hall and Kento said, who's that? And he started giving him a few um, insults through. It's difficult to explain because he gives them through Japanese plays on words. So, um, and then this guy says, well, I wonder if you... You are, you are the dog. And again, they just, they just insult off each other um, because... He says Inu means dog and he means it for another word. But let's jump that. Let's jump that. It's not quite rare that a samurai is well disciplined if born in a samurai family. And so if you would behave in an impressive way, then you would be able to distinguish yourself even more as a samurai. Though I have far less experience than you, I have worked as a mercenary. The mercenary is my word there. It'll be Ronin. Here and there since I was young. And now I am well known. Some lords appreciate that and are willing to employ me for a very high splendid. If you stay with one clan and you are as good as an ancient Chinese warrior, there's a famous ancient Chinese warrior, that know that you could be of a much higher rank if you knew about the ways of other domains. What a waste it is that you stay in the same clan and know nothing of others. At this, canto, at this the lowest ranking samurai was at a loss for words and became very polite after that. So basically what we have in this story, and now let me get, let this right, this is not, this is not a modern story. This is a story written by a samurai in 1654 about the older days, the warring days and the days when, you know, things happened. And he talks about the way things were in the past. And he and this became a sort of manual for other samurai to get their heads around certain stuff because the time of peace have come. Now, two of the two of the things here that we're really looking at are two terms are fudai, which is a generational retainer. So Kento, there is a fudai. He's a generational retainer. And you get Tozama, a newcomer. Now, most the problem lies here is that most people have an understanding of Edo period Japan. A samurai is born as a samurai. He wears two swords. Non samurai don't wear two swords. And that samurai is the son of this father who served the clan, who's the son of that father who served the clan. That's a very Edo period thing because nearly everyone in the Edo period does exactly that. Those two terms, Fudai and Tozama, end up being dropped from their original meaning and picked up with a new meaning to mean those who supported. Tokugawa Yasu and those who didn't support Tokugawa Yasu, insiders and outsiders. But originally those terms meant people who had been generational retainers for many years and some people who had come and moved between clans. Now, the samurai here who's moved between clans is saying, don't stick with one clan, Just you're a ronin, just do a year here, go do a war, go do a war there, go come here, do that. It's the time of the wars, go learn that clan skills, go learn that clan skills. Go learn that clan skills and you'll become such a rounded, travelled warrior that you will be absolutely like 
relied upon because you know about war you've been out to war you know how to travel you know how to do this and he's saying in contrast those people who've never left their domains and never really done anything and just served the lord and said hi yes yes sir hi hi and walked around but maybe i don't have the military experience if that clan have not been to war yet are in a lesser position they might have the well I, my fathers and father and father and father served this clan and we are you know reliable but he's saying well that doesn't really count for anything if you haven't got the experience that i have got by going out there and getting a name for yourself so this is where the term mercenary becomes like do we use how do else do we term so let's give me your ideas guys how do we term a samurai to me i've used the term mercenary i stand by that time but like nick says it's a problematic term because people can jump to the wrong ideas but how do we term someone who absolutely has served say 15 lords 10 lords five lords whatever it is he's been around he's served lots of people he's fought in different wars and he might have done two years in peace with one clan moved to another place got bored of it then it might be a six month campaign somewhere then move somewhere else you know there's there's a lot of samurai hundreds of thousands to millions samurai out there doing different campaigns and different stuff if not millions of samurai over the time um and some of them are a high, high percentage. We're talking hundreds of thousands, if not a million people. Again, don't take those numbers as concrete. I'm just guessing at those numbers. Basically, you've got those people going out there, moving between people, moving between lords. If it's 100,000 men, we have an underground current of what I would term mercenaries moving around the battlefield of, of Japan, hiring themselves out. Most of the records of that are lost because... There's most of the records in the Sengoku period are lost. We don't have that type of thing. But we do know from echoes later that, yes, there was tens, hundreds of thousands of people who were samurai, who were ronin, who were samurai in summer, ronin in winter, samurai again in summer, samurai in winter, ronin in summer. You know, they've moved around. And like Nick says, <coughs> 100,000 are reckoned to be at the Battle of... Um, oh, oh, my God. I thought the siege of Osaka, sorry, on the, you know, the siege of Osaka and they've so many people are meant to be there as Ronins. And it shows to show that this idea that the Ronins just jump out of nowhere and do like Master of the Samurai begging is not. But let me bring you on. So, so the main problem is, is what do we term these Samurai who move around and are employed by different people and they are not punished for that. In fact, they are hired at higher rankings because they have got the military experience in the Sengoku period. This can't happen in the Edo period because Japan society is locked down, all taps are closed, it doesn't happen anymore. And we, in fact, get an explosion of Ronin and there's a massive problem. And the best person to tell you about that is Stephen Najiri. He's the best person to tell you about that. Right, if you'll do a video for this month. But he's behind. So uh, let's get on to the final thing is I listened to a podcast. Which was an academic podcast. I think it was part of the great courses. And it was talking about um, Japanese culture and the rise of Japan. And it also included an entire um, lecture on the rise of Japanese cinema. And the connection between, and which Nick points out, the connection between Westerns, spaghetti Westerns, and Akira Kurosawa and that idea now the general this is not my information this comes from this lecture podcast this academic podcast and it says that basically america and japan from the early 20th century were borrowing ideas in cinema and what happened is akira kurosawa did the seven samurai and the seven samurai becomes quite popular over here yo jimbo and did things like that and the directors over here that so he was the 1950s black and white 1950s and the directors by the 1960s had seen those films now in Japanese culture, a ronin puts a toothpick in his mouth because he says, I've eaten. So in the cinema, the popular ronin idea, the poor ronin is hungry, but he puts a toothpick in his mouth because that shows to people, hey, I've already eaten. I, I've fed. I'm not hungry. I'm OK. I'm OK in society. And that idea and the, the one man against the army is brought about with clint eastwood now clint eastwood does a load of films where he's the one man against the other people and you get the the uh, magnificent seven which is a direct copy of the seven samurai but you get this idea a string of videos where clint eastwood is a lone gunslinger he's a yojimbo basically or he's a ronin because th that character is ripped straight off akira kurosawa and this isn't like hidden knowledge this is well known in cinema history and to the point that he even puts a toothpick or a straw in his mouth but they don't know why. They're just copying the Japanese looking cool against the wall like that with a straw in his mouth. 
Clint Eastwood's there because he's being, they're literally ripping off a Kira Kurosawa. Right? So that's why Clint Eastwood has forever got a straw in his mouth. It's actually, he is a ronin showing that he's eaten food. He's just unsure if the director knows why he's doing it. So there you go, guys. That is my response to the shogunate all of the shogunate's points are positive all are great he did a great job as always and um i just wanted to bring on that mercenary thing so let's finish off with a joke here guys what is et short for you're all gonna say extraterrestrial aren't you no nope. he's always just got little legs hasn't he? that's why he's short <laughs> right guys see you later i get yourself a copy of samurai and ninja which has them turns in and get yourself a copy of uh, samurai war stories and keep up to date